So psychological selling is all about how to in, how to make that impact on a prospect where you connect at a deep emotive level, where you differentiate yourself, you make yourself memorable. And along the way, you make them feel a certain way that hopefully increases the odds that you're going to close the sale. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I've got Paul Newberger with us, and we're going to talk about psychological selling, the secrets to cold call success. Paul, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, the pleasure is all mine. By, by way of introduction, uh, Paul is the president of the Star Group, which is one of the largest family-owned independent insurance agencies in Wisconsin, where I went to college, you know, Badger, Badger Maps, or I was a Badger. Um, so I know the area well. Paul is also known as the cold call coach, teaching thousands of students in more than 100 com- countries now uh, to help sales professional sales professionals close more sales. Paul's book, The Secrets to Cold Call Success, has helped readers transform their approach to selling and in general, leveraging psychology to connect with prospects quickly. Um, Paul, first question is what, to zoom out, what is psychological selling? Yeah, well, I think it all kind of boils down to one of my credos in life. It's true in sales. It's also true in other aspects of life. But I would say this, people won't always remember what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel when you said it. So selling is all about emotion. And I think where some salespeople get this a little wrong is they keep trying to appeal to the logical brain. Well, wait a minute, I saved you money. Well, wait a minute, I I increased your coverage. Well, wait a minute, I made you your life more efficient and effective. Despite all that stuff, you didn't go forward with me. Well, why is that? Logically, it doesn't make sense. Well, you're right. Logically, it doesn't make sense because people are not logical buyers. People are emotional buyers. And really, the only time they use logic is to justify an emotional decision. It's really truly how you make them feel, the kind of experience that you're going to give them. And that starts to explain some of this odd purchasing behavior from time to time with respect to our prospects. I saved him twice the money, but he stayed with his current guy. Yeah, because he feels better with his current guy. But wait a minute. I solved every single problem that he wanted to. And on paper, this makes a lot more sense. Yep. But again, you you just didn't connect with him. It it, it just doesn't feel right in that person's opinion. So psychological selling is all about how how to make that impact on a prospect where you connect at a deep emotive level, where you differentiate yourself, you make yourself memorable. And along the way, you make them feel a certain way that hopefully increases the odds that you're going to close the sale. And, and how do you know whether you're dealing with someone who's in an emotional state versus a logical state? And, and why, is this, why is this so important to know uh, if people are an emotional buyer instead of a logical buyer? Well, I would say everybody's an emotional buyer to some degree. Now, now, some people have a little bit more of a higher logical pulse than an emotional impulse, but your logical brain is just simply overridden by your emotional brain. And, and it's just, you don't have to take my word for it, just kind of look at how the brain is structured. I mean, your uh, logical part of the brain, which they, which, is the, which they would call the prefrontal cortex, which is more of the superficial brain, the shallow brain, uh, that, that's really helping with logic and reasoning and communication with other people, especially from an evolutionary perspective when people started to socialize. I mean, that's where a lot of that comprehension takes place. But when you look at the emotional brain, uh, that's the amygdala. Uh, it's, it's, I guess, what they would also refer to as the lizard brain. You've got two of them. They're about the size of a cashew or an almond, and you've got both of them on either side of your head, right above your ears. Um, if you've ever been in a situation where there's a fight or flight response, good luck trying to override that with the adrenaline and with the pupil dilation and the increased blood flow. Now, granted, what we're not doing is we're not necessarily giving people a fight or flight response Uh, on a cold call or in some kind of a sales meeting, but it's still the impulse that comes from the amygdala is still that much stronger than the prefrontal cortex. Think about the last diet that you were on. 
And you've been trying like hell over the course of four days to eat like a rabbit and stay away from the Wendy's Baconators. And then uh, your son buys three Baconators, leaves one on the counter and you see it, you smell it. And the memory of all oh, that Baconator that I had six months ago, boy, that really tasted good. Good luck trying to overcome that impulse. Some can. It's just very hard psychologically to override an emotional impulse. That's why we play to it. That's why we cater to it. That's why we build our scripts around it. And it takes a very special person to override it, which is why more often than not, we have success on the phone. So yeah, tell me more about that. Tell me about how salespeople can become better at emotional selling. Yeah, it, it's all really about appealing to a deeper sense of the prospect. Uh, it, it, it's really divided into a couple things, I would say. So the first one is differentiation. Differentiation appeals to the emotional brain more than the logical brain. How are you different than every other person that has ever cold called this individual before? How is your organization different than any other organization that they've been exposed to before? And part of the way that you differentiate yourself to take a page out of Simon Sinek's book, it's not what you do. Everybody to some degree does what you do. It's not even so much how you do it. Again, there's a lot of people that conduct business in the way that you do. It really can be found in your why. Why do you do what you do? Why have you made this your living? Why are you so passionate about getting up for work every day and coming to the office? You are the only person on planet Earth that has that why. That differentiates you. That allows you to stand alone. And your why is usually rooted in some kind of an emotional story. Storytelling by itself is a way to connect with somebody at a deep emotive level. You weren't there when this transpired. You weren't there when this took place, but I painted a picture in your mind that made you feel like you were there. You see what I see, you felt what I felt. You experience what I experienced because I'm going into that emotional layer versus the logical layer. So differentiation is certainly one. I think another aspect of emotional selling is making yourself memorable. When you're telling the story, are you using details and specifics? Are you painting a vivid picture? Are you describing this in bright visual details? Or are you just leaving a lot to the imagination? And if you're leaving a lot to the imagination, you can't just assume that they're seeing it exactly the way that you intended them to see it. So through differentiation, through telling your why, through uh, walking the prospect through some kind of a story or two, and really making yourself memorable by the types of stories that you tell, the details and the specifics, it's just very hard to escape it. And along the way, as you start telling these stories, again, people buy people first. They don't buy companies first. I hate to break the news to some people that just maybe don't necessarily uh, see that viewpoint, but once they buy you, now you have the keys to the kingdom. But as you're telling these stories, they learn about you. They learn about why you do what you do. They learn about your passions. They learn about the intangibles that you possess. And along the way, wow, he's a Christian, so am I. Wow, he's got kids, so do I. Wow, he loves the Packers, so do I. And after a while, it's, man, I like this guy. Sure, I'll continue this conversation. Let's get a meeting at some point. I love it. Such powerful advice. Um, you know, just, I, I feel like I've, that, that's something that I, I always try to roll around in the back of my head when I'm, when I'm in sales situations. Fo focus on the why to connect with people on an emotional level. And, and it's almost like you want to be vulnerable and show why you're, it's showing a part of yourself. Like, why is this important to me? Why do I do this? Why, why you know, it lets them get to know you better and, and, and connect with you. And a lot of times, you know, you're, you're solving a problem for a customer. I mean, I, you're almost always solving a problem. And the, the why do I care to solve this problem is, is it, it, I think it's really interesting to people. Well, and then one of the things, and again, it takes, it, it takes a little bit of confidence. You have to go outside of your comfort zone, but that's one of the things that I want everybody listening to this podcast to really internalize. Nothing good ever happens inside the cozy confines of your comfort zone. If you're not willing to try something new, you're always going to suck. If you're not willing to uh, step out of that comfort zone, try something different. If you're not willing to make yourself vulnerable, be the authentic you, take a risk, you are never going to get to where you aspire to be. I don't care how many excellent podcasts like this one you listen to. And, and again, it, you have to, you first have to figure out who are you? What is your why? Why do you do what you do? And if you can't answer that, we've got some bigger problems. Thankfully, my 
company offers wide development training. But even outside of that, one of the things that I know about me, and I'm not trying to be controversial here. I'm just trying to give you exactly what I mean by this, a concrete example. My number one most favorite relationship in life is with God. I'm a spiritual man. You don't have to be. Your listeners don't have to be. I'm never going to apologize for putting God first in my life. I don't feel the need to do that. But there's a number of people that will avoid talking about politics and religion with strangers like the bubonic plague. I understand the logic behind that. You don't want to go onto a call and say, hey, those Republicans, hey, those Democrats, don't they stink? Like, you don't want to do that because you don't want to offend anybody. But I like to put out a little feeler to see if people can resonate with something. So for me, uh, because my faith is so important, I use strategic word substitutions. So for instance, one of the words that I use with respect to my faith, I don't say hope. I don't believe in hope necessarily. Like hope is a good thing for all of us to have, but I'm not going to say, hey, I hope you're having a good day because that seems too passive. That seems too reactive. That seems like there's a lot of stuff outside of my control. As a Christian, I believe there's a lot in my control. So rather than saying, I hope you have a good day, instead I say, I pray you're having a good day. And one of the things that's interesting is once I know who I am, once I know my why, and once I know what I want to throw out there to start showing people the things that make me me, I'll do those word substitutions. If they don't glom onto it, we move on. Fine. I threw it out there. He didn't take it. So let's move on. But you know what happens? More often than not, they do glom on to that. Hey, Bob, I, I pray you're having a good day and that you and your family had a blessed Christmas. A lot of times they will glom on to it. We did have a blessed Christmas. Thank you very much. We went to church. Oh, you went to church. What church do you go to? Next thing you know, we're talking about stuff at a very deep level that makes us connect, that allows us to buy each other, that gets us to go, man, this is a refreshing conversation because I'm not just talking to somebody I might want to sell to. In my opinion, I'm talking to a brother in Christ and we're connecting around faith. Now, it doesn't have to be faith. It can be a bunch of other examples, but throwing out little word substitutions, little feelers like that, especially if they resonate, really allows you to hit these people at a deep emotive level quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so powerful. What are some other areas that you might look to connect with people on? Um, you know, a couple that come to mind, sports, um, where people are from, what they're what they're into, are they married or not, family, things like that. What what, what are some of you, what, what are some that you uh, would coach people to to use other than other than religion or politics? Yeah, so I, I, I like to go deep quick. So I don't want to do the superficial stuff. Sports is pretty superficial in my humble opinion. I mean, is it nice to bond over the Packers who are going to the NFC championship game, by the way? All right. Well, uh, in, in, in Wisconsin, the Packers are a religion last I checked. <laughs> so yes. Yeah, so notwithstanding uh, the Pope, AKA Aaron Rodgers, and the Packers. Uh, yeah. I, I would like to go a little bit deeper than that. So a lot of times when you ask somebody, how you doing, especially if you're, you're the one that's instigating that, how you doing? Well, if, if it's a call that they, you know, they're having for the first time, they don't really know you, you're likely to get a superficial answer. Fine. How are you? Don't respond in kind, go deep, tell them something and tell them something of substance. Perhaps, uh, oh man, I'm feeling really refreshed today. Actually um, had a chance. Uh, I hate to admit it, but I've got workaholic tendencies from time to time. Sometimes it's hard to pull myself away from the office, but I was able to hit the pause button in life over the weekend. I took my three children, Kennedy, eight, Hudson, six, and my baby girl, Reagan, who's three, just daddy kids weekend, went to Chuck E. Cheese, ate pizza, watched a bunch of SpongeBob SquarePants. Oh, it was marvelous. So I'm refreshed and ready to go. Thank you for asking. Just now, now seeing what they glom onto, they, they, they got to be a pretty cold hearted person to go. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and if it is move on. But a lot of times you're going to hear because I'm selling myself as a person there. I'm hitting them at a deep emotive level. There. I'm talking about my kids. I'm talking about my struggles to some degree with workaholism. I'm talking about the fun things we did with my kids. Maybe now they're reminiscing about their kids. If they didn't have kids, I'd really like to have kids. Who knows? But they're thinking emotionally. They're likely to glom onto something. Oh, that's really cool. You do that. Don't just stop there. Yeah, it is. Thanks. Yeah. Well, it wasn't always that way. I've, I've really kind of struggled with that to some degree. I've really had to build it in and I got to tell you, seeing the smile on my kids' faces when I tell them it's, it's daddy kids weekend, that makes it all worth it. So throwing little things out there, answering honestly, giving them a piece of you. How are you ever going to expect them to reciprocate if you can't first give them something? Make yourself vulnerable. Be authentically you. 
If they don't want it, they'll pass on it. No big deal. But the, the upside is you say something that resonates with them. They now start sharing stories with you. Wow, that's, wow, I envy you that. My kids are in college now. They're in their late 20s. I missed out on that opportunity. I wish I had it back. Oh, man, they just opened the door so wide a truck could drive through. Run with that. Go with that. Start a conversation. By the time that rapport is done, man, you don't even need to make the sales pitch because it's virtually done for you. Right. Oh, and, you know, I think a lot of people might feel that it's awkward to put yourself out there with a stranger, you know, especially in a cold call situation. How how do you get over that awkwardness of, of emoting at that level that you're talking about and describing and can, you know, putting yourself out there at that level, especially during a, a cold call? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, how can you expect them to do something you first are not willing to do? Now, maybe you're not asking them their family history. Maybe you're not asking their blood type. Maybe you're not asking their deepest, darkest secret, but you're asking them to commit something to you, commit to a meeting with you, commit to buying something from you commit to watching a demo. And I would argue that you're intruding on their most sacred resource, which is their time. Money comes and goes. You can always get more. Time is the most precious commodity that you have. We all have a finite amount of it. And once it's gone, it's gone. This podcast, I was very much looking forward to this. I'm not saying anything to the contrary, but this is a set amount of time I will never, ever get back. And if you're going to be a salesperson, you got to be a good steward of that. Why would somebody invest their time in you if you're not first willing to give them something in return? And th th this really started to crystallize for me when I was a financial advisor with Thrive and Financial. This, this is where I developed my cold call methodology. This is where I became a really good student of psychological selling. I, I just happened, I got self-conscious. Let's just say this. I'm sitting down with somebody for the first time. They were a referral of a friend. I've never really had a conversation with this person outside of getting this meeting booked. And after a few pleasantries, we're going into this. I'm basically saying, tell me your financial goals. Wow. Can we at least hold hands before we kiss? Me then going, what's your credit score? What's your credit card debt? How much debt burden are you carrying overall? How much money are you saving every month? Whoa, 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 whoa. I know you're a financial advisor, but that's still a lot of personal information to share in a short amount of time. I just got very self-conscious. How am I going to get them to go there if I first aren't willing to go there? And I just made a decision in my mind. I'm going to give them a little piece of me up front before we start to go deep, just so they know that they can trust me. Hey, regardless of how this meeting goes, you're always going to have this on me. Hey, regardless of what comes next or whether we do business together or not, you're always going to have this on me. And I would always lead with my why, because my why involves a personal family tragedy, a death in the family that continues to devastate my family almost 10 years thereafter. I give them that. I give them something powerful that they will always have in an effort to lower the inhibition, lower the wall, lower the red flags, because how are they ever going to be authentically them if I'm not willing to be authentically me? And if your listeners are not willing to go there, stop complaining when your prospect isn't either. So what would you say you do to get a prospect interested? So like, how do you spike interest in a prospect? How do you, how do you get them um, on, the, on the line, so to speak? It would take a, a, an answer longer than we probably have on this conversation, but I can give you some thoughts. Again, I've, I've been kind of rattling through some of them to get us going again. If you let's just talk about this in a cold call perspective. Again, number one, you got to sell yourself as a person as opposed to selling your company. You're just going to sound different. You're going to come across different. And you don't sell yourself as a person by going, hi, Bob, I'm Paul. I'm a discipline. Uh, I believe in discipline. I'm a Sagittarius and I love tacos. That's not what I mean by selling you. You sell yourself by the stories you tell, the why you give, the passion in your voice. Like, wow, this, this person's got a lot of energy. That's how you start going about telling your why. Uh, the differentiation that we talked about, hitting them at a motive level, that all adds up in an effort to pique that curiosity. But I think one of the other things that you really got to do is you got to have a hook. And that hook is what I call the value add proposition or VAP, V-A-P for short. Most cold callers cold call to sell something. 
They sell you on an idea. They sell you on a product. They sell you on a service. They sell you on a way that their organization is, is really going to help you or your company. Well, for me, I don't believe that the secret to cold call success is the cold call to sell anything. Rather, I believe the, cold, the secret to cold call success is to cold call to give something. What is it that you can give this prospect? And what I mean by giving is you're offering something without the expectation of return. Can you give an idea? Can you give a best practice? Can you give a referral? Can you give access? Can you give some type of insight that is gonna enrich their life in some way? And if you're always cold calling to give something, even if they might not wanna do business with you, you, you mentioned the Star Group with respect to insurance. Yeah, I don't wanna buy insurance, I already have a guy. Well, that's good, I'm glad you already have a guy. I'd still like to give you this complimentary assessment. Or, you know what, Paul, we just moved our group benefits. We're not interested in doing that right now. Well, that's okay. I'm glad to hear you're working with somebody that you trust. I still think you might be a good guest for our podcast because they just need to know me. I mean, one of the most common rebuttals that I hear, both from myself and from the clients that I teach, is I've already got a guy or a gal. Well, of course. How could you begrudge? Of course you got a guy. You haven't met me yet. How can I begrudge you for that? I just got to get to know you better. Once we learn about each other, you're going to want to move over here is what I'm thinking in my head. So all the things that we talked about, talking about an emotional level, selling yourself as a person, making yourself memorable, telling a story, but being one of those few people that's actually cold calling to give something is going to get you that dedicated time. And if you get that dedicated time, you now have that opportunity to sell yourself and take this to the next level. Yeah. And I'm sure I've said this before uh, on other shows, but um... I've always had a philosophy that in, in your whole life, you get to keep about 10% of the value you create. So if you just focus on creating as much value as you can, like you'll, and, and just giving and giving and giving, you'll, you'll get to keep, you'll, you'll, you'll get to get some stuff too. But, uh, and, the, and the more you give, the more, the more you'll get. So. Well, and, um, and can I talk to that real quick? That That's an yeah. excellent point. And, and that, that's one thing I don't want lost on your listeners. I call this political capital. And I mean this in a good way. People are not stupid. Gatekeepers are not stupid. Prospects are not stupid. Well, they're highly intelligent human beings. And individuals are driven by two things, self-interest and self-preservation. Now hear me out. I'm not saying selfish. I'm not saying greedy. I'm not saying narcissistic. We're driven by self-interest and self-preservation. For instance, I eat to live. It's in my self-preservation to have lunch. I go to work to make money. It's in my self-interest to keep going to work. Some people, again, you appeal to that logical brain. I was just talking to this HR director. Wait a minute, I could save her hundreds of thousands of dollars from her organizational budget if she switches group benefits and she said no. Well, that's assuming she likes her job. Maybe she doesn't. That ain't my money, what do I care? I'm, I'm applying for a job anyway, I'm out of here soon. That, that seems pessimistic, but again, it's not so much in her self-interest and self-preservation to do something like that. That's where we really need to hit these people at a deep emotive level. That's where we really need to start making that connection. If I can offer a sales guy some referrals, wow, um, yeah, that would be good for me if I got some referrals. Sure, I'll meet with you. If you're giving value, if their life is better because you're a part of it, and if you're opening doors and offering things without expecting anything in return, pretty soon after after four nice things I've done for you, four ways I've enriched your life, four ways I've gone above and beyond without asking anything in return, usually people will ask the greatest question in the history of sales. Thanks, Paul. What can I do for you? That's where you know you have them. Well, actually, I'd love to tell you about what we can do from a group benefits perspective at the Star Group. Sure, come on in. Well, uh, actually, I just wrote a best-selling book called The Secrets to Cold Call Success. I'd love to work with your team on how to get you to where you wanna be. Sure, let's have a conversation about that. So again, just by giving value, just from a cynical side, you're building this political capital. People don't wanna turn off the gravy train. People don't wanna turn off the spigot. I want this guy to keep sending me referrals. I want this guy to keep doing nice things. At some point, I'm going to have to give if I want this to continue. And that give could in fact be your sale. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and, and I think, you know, well, and, and, and I, I have a lot of, uh, 
a lot I, I generally try to just like think about things in this giving way and like I do things that like as favors to people and I try to create value and like I think some of it does come back to me in sales and probably nine out of ten times it doesn't but you know maybe it comes back in a different way or you know um I I, I do really believe if the you know the the more you give the more you get in this world and so you know and, and I think uh it, what would you say um how 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 can salespeople tune into their prospects' favorite radio station, WIFM? What what's in it for me? Yeah, well, it it really starts the pro. The, you got to ask questions. You got to get to know this individual, and a lot of times it's as easy as what we had just discussed to some degree. You've got a personal layer and you've got a professional layer, and, and everybody thinks, well, the only way that I can really bring value to somebody is the personal layer. So I got to learn about their kids. I got to learn about their religion. I got to learn about their hobbies. That's not true. And sometimes on a cold call, you don't have the luxury of time to get to that level. So you can also give them value based on what they do professionally. And there's two ways that I would look at this. So number one, you look at their job title. I don't know who this individual is based on what makes him tick, but I know he's the vice president of sales. I can probably guess what a vice president of sales is accountable for. So put some thought into that. What does this person do each and every day? What are probably some of the struggles this person faces? What is this person accountable for? And what are some of those boxes that he or she has to check if they want to keep their job? Can you bring value to them in such a way that you make it easier for them to do their job? Now, when I talk about value, I'm not saying I provide good customer service. When I talk about value, I'm not saying, well, I give you my cell phone number. Value just means what can I give you above and beyond the services I'm paid to provide. So one, we can use common sense. We have an idea of what a CFO would need. We have an idea of what a VP of sales would need. But I would say in addition to that, we should ask a very good question when we have the opportunity. And that question is this, what are some of the challenges you're encountering right now that make your job difficult? And no matter how they answer that, you now have a way to tap into WIFM. And, and let's just say I'm talking to a vice president of sales. And let's say I'm trying to sell them on my cold call services. As you mentioned, we have clients in all 50 states. We got students in 127 countries. So if I'm trying to sell a VP of sales on my cold call coaching services, I might just ask, what are some of the things that make your job tough? Now, I'm hoping he says, we need to schedule more appointments. Good, I can help. I'm hoping he says, well, we're having a down year due to COVID. I can help. But what if he says something like this? Well, you know what? It's interesting. I've got a sales team of 15. And I've had three empty seats for months. I cannot find three good salespeople to save my life. And it's making it more difficult for me to hit my goal. I, I'm not a recruiter. I'm not a headhunter. I don't get paid to do that. That's not my job, but that's the essence of value. Can I help this person above and beyond the services that I'm paid to provide? And my answer is most assuredly, yes. I'm connected to salespeople all over the country. Maybe I can send one or two referrals his way. I think he would like that. Number two, I'm connected. To recruiters, headhunters, staffing agencies. Maybe I know somebody that specializes in sales openings. Hey, I can help with that. Number three, I'm a monster on LinkedIn. There's people that are way bigger than me, but I've got over 30,000 followers on LinkedIn. Maybe I can just do a quick post. Hey, had a conversation with my friend at ABC Manufacturing. They're looking for two really good, three really good salespeople. Here's the job description. Let me know if you're interested. I then go back to the VP of sales five days later. Hey, you got two people coming your way. They're friends of mine. I'd like to introduce you to Jerry. He's a sales recruiter. He doesn't charge you unless he finds somebody. And oh, by the way, my post on LinkedIn has already gotten 18,000 views. Don't you think they're going to be excited about that? Don't you think they're going to be happy? Don't you think, gee, Paul, thanks. How can I repay you? So tuning into WIFM is as simple as just having a basic understanding about what a person in their line of work is accountable for and asking that question, hey, what are some of the things that make your job challenging and see how you can assist with that, whether you're paid to do it or not. And every sales rep has, you know, unique characteristics that, that make them successful. How can a sales rep identify what it is that's unique about them, what unique characteristics they possess that make them successful? How do they kind of get in touch with what those things are and figure out how those traits help salespeople differentiate themselves from their competitors. Yeah, so we call these intangibles. 
Intangibles, these are a, a basket of skill sets that you possess. You were born with these. You cannot learn these in any classroom. Uh, these are skill sets that get enhanced and refined as time goes on. They get enhanced and refined by the people that come in your life, by the circumstances that you face, by the things that you encounter as you age. These are a basket of traits that give you a competitive advantage over your rivals that don't possess them. And quite frankly, these make your clients love to be around you. Now, you could be somebody that has low self-esteem and you're thinking, I don't have any redeeming qualities whatsoever that would make anybody like me. Well, first of all, you're wrong. I don't, I don't care how depressed you get, how anxious you get, how deep, dark places you get to. There's always something about you that makes you special. I mean, everybody listening to this is a truly once for all time person. God made you that way. And take it from a guy who struggled with anxiety, depression, and was borderline suicidal for over a decade. There is something special about everybody. And if you can't find it, one of the things that I would ask the listeners to do is to seek out the advice of someone that you trust. It can be your spouse. It could be a significant other. It could be your parent. It could be a coworker. It could be your boss. It could be your neighbor. It could be your roommate. It doesn't matter. But what I would want everybody to do is to identify these intangibles that they possess. No more than five. You only really need to identify five. And you should put them in priority order. If you've ever done an assessment, like the culture index or one of those other things that's out there, maybe it's already identified these for you. But the secret is to first figure out what those five are. And if you need to elicit somebody's assistance to help you with that, please do that. And then once you have those five intangibles, the secret now is to build a script, to build your talk tracks, to build what you're going to say around those intangibles to highlight them and put them in the most favorable light. So I'll give you three quick examples. One of my intangibles is you probably have already seen is passion. I can't, I can't help it. If you ask me to come here and be quiet, you got the wrong guest. I'm so freaking passionate about this stuff. It comes out. I'm a high energy, high octane kind of guy. And for some people, they really like that. You can't fake that. It just comes out in the delivery. Number two, one of the one of the intangibles is humor. So if somebody's got the humor intangible, maybe they're making witty observations. Maybe we proactively have them crack a joke, but something to keep the mood light to showcase that intangible. And another intangible, I do, I possess this as well, but so do other people, is the intangible of wit. I think on my feet, the words just come to me. I don't need a lot of time to, to say what's going to come out of my mouth. And if somebody is cold calling and they have the wit intangible, they're not going to have much of a script because they can think on their feet. They don't need somebody telling them exactly what to say. So identify those five intangibles, get assistance from people within your network, people that you trust, people that are going to give you an honest opinion. And then based on those, in, those intangibles, then you build your cold call script around it to put those intangibles in the most favorable light possible. All right, so you've kind of gone through your cold call and you've, you've, uh, we've talked about several elements of that. What about the end? How, how do you, what, what do you think about when you're ending a cold call or any kind of call with a client? And, and what are some common mistakes that, that sales reps make when they're ending calls with clients? Several things. So when I'm doing, when I'm ending a call, uh, for those folks that have ever seen Happy Gilmore with Adam Sandler, I just think of just tap it in, tap, tap, tap a -roo, tap a -roo. You're almost there. Just tap it in. Don't do more than you have to do. So a couple common mistakes. One, people don't close because they don't shut up. They do what I call self-incriminating. You have them. They're ready to make the sale. They're ready to do dedicated time. And you just stop talking. Have the confidence to say, I got it this far. Just tap it in. The distance between a tap is a lot shorter than the distance between a drive. You've already driven it. Just tap it. Just say a few little things to end the call. Number two, don't ask a question to end the call. Make it a declarative statement. A confident person never says more than they have to, but a confident person doesn't need to ask questions, it's especially at the end when people are already going, I'm interested. This makes sense. He's got my attention. Where do we go from here? If somebody's going, where do we go from here? And then I ask a question. Well, who answers a question with a question? If somebody says, this sounds great, what's the next step in their head? And you basically say, what would you like the next step to be? Wait a minute, dummy, 
I want you to tell me what the next step is. So I'd like to end the cold call or I'd like to end that initial conversation on a declarative statement rather than a question. Another common misconception is at the end, people use formal buzzwords when they should be talking via informal language. Again, we talk about Happy Gilmore, just tap it in. I call this self-incrimination. And if you think about it from a legal sense, self-incrimination, I've got somebody up on the witness stand, but based upon what I said and how I said it, I contradicted my earlier statement. I incriminated myself and the jury finds me guilty. When you're cold calling, self-incrimination is this, based on what you say and how you say it, the person on the other end of the phone assumes you're nothing more than a salesman. And if you've got them up to the end and they're hanging with you, this is the world's worst time to self-incriminate. And it could be as easy as saying a formal buzzword. Meeting is a formal buzzword. Appointment is a formal buzzword. Webinar, seminar, lunch and learn, conference, those are all formal buzzwords. Talk about emotional selling, psychological selling. When I say appointment, what do you think of? I think of the dentist and that's not a pleasant image. When I think of a meeting, what do you think of? I think stuffy boardroom, bright red suits. That's not a pleasant image to be thinking about. So substitute a formal buzzword with an informal catchphrase. So rather than meeting, how about pop in? Just think about what pop in does psychologically. What do you think of when you hear pop in? I think of me sitting at my desk, somebody opens the door, sticks their head in and goes, hey, how are you? Everything good? Okay, bye-bye. That's easy enough. Pop in, stop by, swing through, say hello. If you're making a phone call, how about this? Find some time, hop on a call. That's not even literally possible. How are you going to hop on a call? Another word, another phrase that's informal that's not literally possible, which is why it's one of my favorites, is grab a chat. How do you do that? I know how to grab a pen. I know how to grab a coffee cup. I don't know how to grab a chat per se. So you keep it informal. You make it a declarative sentence. You keep it very, very short to avoid self-incrimination. I think that's the key to wrapping up a successful cold call. Makes a ton of sense. Well, I think we're ready for the next section of our podcast today, sales in 60 seconds. So first question, how has the pandemic affected cold calling? Now is the greatest time in the history of the world to cold call. And I'll keep it quick because we're in this new segment. Let's say pre-COVID, every person cold called. You have 100% of the population. Since COVID, I'd say roughly 65% have stopped cold calling because they look at it as insensitive. They look at it as not in touch with reality. You're not paying attention to people's needs. So they've taken themselves out, which leaves you with 35%. Of that 35%, 32.5% don't know any better. So they're still cold calling the same old way that they were before. And now they do look tone deaf. Now they do look insensitive and they're getting slaughtered which leaves you with 2.5% of the population left. These are the people that are still in the, re- the arena, but they're doing it in a smarter way. As I said earlier, they're cold calling not to sell anything. They're cold calling to give everything. And when an organization is hurting, when an organization is desperate, when an organization is at their wits end, and you're calling not to sell, but to offer a referral, to offer promotion on LinkedIn, to offer a networking opportunity, to give them free tickets to an event, whatever the case is, you stand out and you get the dedicated time. There has never been a greater time in the history of the world of cold calling. And if you're not doing it all day, every day, you are missing out on some serious opportunity. Absolutely. What what would you say the, the number one mistake you see with salespeople who are making cold calls? The number one mistake that I see with people that are making cold calls is they're tone deaf. Uh, they're, they're making it all about their organization. And this is kind of goes back to what we're talking about. They're making it all about their company. Well, people don't buy companies first. People buy you first. Stop leading with your organization. I don't care. I don't buy that first. I need to trust, like, respect, and admire the person on the other end. But if you're spending so much time telling me about how great your company is, about all the stuff your company does, you are never getting to what I buy first. So the biggest mistake is people lead with their company. And if only people would start selling themselves and their intangibles more, the success is literally night and day. What, what inspired you to become a cold call coach? 
my motto in life is making the impossible possible. That's literally what gets me out of bed every day. I know we haven't spent a lot of time talking about me personally, but in addition to being president of the Star Group, I own four businesses. In addition to being president of the Star Group and own, owning four businesses, I serve on two boards. I've got three children all under the age of eight. And oh, by the way, I've got a hobby or two that I like to try to stay on top of. I don't have enough time in the day. So the reason I do all of these things is because I am driven to show the world that it is possible to make the impossible possible. But it's impossible to cold call anymore successfully. Oh yeah? Watch this. It's impossible to talk about your faith on a secular business platform like LinkedIn and not be slaughtered. Oh yeah? Watch this. It's impossible to teach somebody how to instantaneously differentiate themselves and make themselves memorable within 10 seconds of initiating a conversation. Oh yeah? Watch this. I thrive on showing people that you can make the impossible possible, not for my glory, but to show others that it's within your grasp and you can do whatever you aspire to do as long as you set your mind to it. What's something that you wish you could tell yourself earlier in your career if you could go back in time? That this is a cruel world that will have no problem beating you up and telling you why you're not good enough. And because of that, you need to be immensely kind to yourself. This world constantly is going to beat you up. People in this world are going to constantly beat you up. This world's definition of success is totally at odds with the Christian definition of success. I think a healthy definition of success, you got to be a size zero. Okay, well, that's none of us. You got to have X amount of money. Okay, that's few of us. You got to look a certain way, talk a certain way, have a six pack of abadabas, whatever the case may be. This world has its standard of success that very few people can ever measure up to. And because of that, this world can be very unkind to us. You do yourself no favors by beating yourself up. If this world isn't going to pat you on the back, you got to pat yourself on the back. If this world isn't going to lift you up, you got to lift yourself up. And the Paul M. Newberger of even as recent as five years ago. And again, I'm not perfect, okay? I still struggle with this. It, it's not one of those things you just turn off and everything is cured. But man, I, I would whip myself so hard I would bleed. Not literally, of course, but like, you idiot, how'd you miss that sale? You idiot, why'd you say that um in the middle of your speech? You idiot, how could you miss that deadline? You suck. You need to be kind to yourself. There's a There's a insecure, timid, self-conscious person inside all of us. And every time you whip that little boy or that little girl, it just makes it that much harder for you to live a high quality, enjoyable life. Learn, yes. Improve, yes. Always try to be the best version of yourself, yes. But there's nothing wrong with you looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, you know, it didn't turn out the way that I wanted to today, but I tried my best. I left it all on the table. You know what? I'm proud of you. Nice job, buddy. That would have solved so many problems in my life. And that would solve a lot of problems from people potentially listening to this podcast right now. Absolutely. I could not agree more. Um, how much time do you tell your clients that you're teaching to cold call to prepare before each cold call? This, this always I'm always, I, I'm always flipping back and forth on these, like, the, you know, with, with my team, it's, is it better to just, you know, knock out a whole bunch of calls and, or is it better to knock out fewer calls, but, but better research calls that you know more about? Uh, better calls for sure, but not because of research. I, I advocate you do next to no research in your calls. <laughs> Probably makes me uh, a bird of an interesting feather, but a lot of times people just use research as a crutch. They use research as avoidance behavior. Well, I don't know enough about that company. Give me a few more days. What good is that going to do when you when you when that person picks up the phone and you introduce yourself in an incredibly salesy manner? Well, hi Bob, my name is Paul Newberger, founder of the Cold Call Coach. Just wanted to see if you're happy with your current cold call success rate. I researched you for ten days and you hung up on me in three seconds flat. A lot of good that research did. You're not trying to sell on the cold call. You're not trying to qualify the prospect 
on the cold call. I would even argue you're not trying to proactively build a tremendous amount of rapport on the cold call. That doesn't contradict what I said earlier about finding commonalities. When I talk about proactively build rapport, that's me proactively going, like me, like me, like me, like me. I'm going to get you to like me. If you just have a natural laid back conversation where you ask good questions and have a good give and take, that's going to come. But all that research is for naught if you just don't know how to introduce yourself, if you don't know psychologically how to pique curiosity, if you don't know how to offer something of value, if you don't have a good why and can tell a good story, and if you can't, in the words of Happy Gilmore, tap, tap, tap it in. Nowhere in my cold call script is research necessary. Sure, if you're identifying your ideal client, let's say you're in the B2B space, you're looking for a certain type of organization to call. Okay, granted, spend a little time figuring out how many organizations meet that criteria. Look, I found 37. Good. You don't have to research all 37. You got the 37 call now using the script that we developed. I agree with you that it's quality over quantity, but it's not because I'm spending four hours researching and then I make the call. It's quite frankly, because when you're as good as I am, when you're as good as my clients, you make 10 calls, you schedule eight appointments. There's only so many cold calls you need to make at that point. For sure. Well, I guess as an actionable takeaway, what is the first thing that the salespeople listening today should do to be more successful in their cold calls? It's all about, so I'll give you this as a freebie. And if you like this one, just know this is the tip of the iceberg, baby. There's a whole mountain of ice under the surface where this came from. Think about the introduction. And again, when I talk about self-incrimination, I'm not saying I'm selling anything, but based on what I said and how I say it, you're assuming I'm selling something. Listen to this as an example. Bob picks up the phone. Hi, this is Bob. And I say, well, hey, Bob, my name is Paul Newberger, founder of the Cold Call Coach. Just wanted to see if you're happy with your current cold call success rate. First question, you don't have to answer this, but think inside your head. Are you now assuming you walked into a sales call? And just about everybody's going to say yes. Well, my follow-up question is, what specifically did I say that I was selling? And if you go back and listen to it, I didn't say that I was selling anything. I just said I was interested to see if you were happy with your current cold call success rate. But the answer is it felt salesy. It felt like a sales call. Again, felt is an emotion, emotion versus logic, right? Logically, I didn't say I was selling anything, but people aren't logical buyers, they're emotional buyers. Well, that felt ewy, that felt eh, that felt like a sales call, right? Emotion. Listen to the difference one more time. And just, this is gonna buy you 10 seconds to continue with the call. This is gonna pique curiosity. This is gonna elevate the mood of the prospect all based on how you introduce yourself. Here's the stupid way. Hi, Bob, my name is Paul Newberger, founder of the Cold Call Coach. Just wanted to see if you were happy with your current cold call success rate. Here's the smart way. Hey, Bob, Paul Newberger, how you been? Now, if you want to know what comes next, I charge for that. So a lot of people are going to say, uh, well, then what do you do? Well, again, I'm not going to give away all my secret sauce on a wonderful podcast like this. Feel free to contact me and I'll tell you more. But just if you break the script into chunks, each part, our scripts are comprised of five parts in a certain order. What I just gave you was called the assumptive greeting. You should greet everybody in an assumptive way that makes them assume they've met you. You can't lie. I'm a Christian, right? You can't lie. Bob, Paul Newberg, we met at that cocktail party last week. If you didn't meet at a cocktail party last week, you can't be saying that. But the way that I greeted you made you assume for a minute we've met. Hey, Bob, Paul Newberg, how you been? I now have this person in an uncomfortable position. Crap. Guy sounds like he knows me. Sounds happy to talk to me. Didn't take all this time to introduce myself. Hey, Paul. Uh, hi, how are you? I've elevated their mood to some degree. They're in an uncomfortable position. So now they're hanging on my every word. They're going to be listening for clues to try to figure out who I am because they're looking kind of stupid right now. I've got them exactly where I want them. And now we continue with the rest of the script. That is about, that is the first thing that I've, every listener can start. And you're going to notice that. You're going to hear a pause because they're thinking about who you are. Their voices are going to be a little bit more energetic. You're going to have more time because they're going to try to figure out who you are. That's about, one fiftieth of the tips that we have, and they all work just as well. Yeah, like you know, just from my perspective, if I got a call and someone did, and said said that to me, I'd be like, well, I, instead of thinking in the first script, I'd be thinking, what are they selling me? In the second script, I'm thinking, 
Oh, how do I know this guy? I cannot remember a Paul Newberger. Hmm, Paul, Paul, Paul. <laughs> but, but to your point, but to your point, we are defensive cold callers, not offensive cold callers. Offensive cold calling is what you say. Defensive cold calling is what you don't say. Offensive cold calling is what you put in. Defensive cold calling is what you take out. All I'm trying to do is to buy time, buy time, buy time, buy time. And when you're sitting there going, Paul Newberger, what are you not thinking? To your point, you're not thinking crap sales call. You're thinking, you're not going, woohoo, Paul Newberger, I'm going to get a meeting. You don't know who I am, but you're at least allowing me to continue. You're at least hoping, well, I hope this guy fills in some details because this doesn't ring a bell. Whereas most people are getting shut down after the first sentence, my clients are getting the green light to continue because the prospect is genuinely interested in additional information. Makes perfect sense to me. Well, I'm, I'm going to attempt to summarize some of the wisdom that you've given us here today, because so many of our listeners listen in the car. Um, so to summarize what Paul's taught us here, first of all, buying is emotional. Your logical brain is often overridden by your emotional brain. And it's very hard for anyone to override an emotional impulse. So we make decisions with emotions. You want to appeal to a prospect's emotional brain by first off differentiating yourself. You want to show why you do what you do, why you sell what you sell. Tell an emotional story about you and, and, and then connect it to what you're doing. Um, secondly, um, in terms of appealing to their, their emotional brain, you want to make yourself memorable. You want to do this through stories. You want to give details that really appeal to your prospect. Give them things to hang on to. To understand what's going to resonate with your prospects and customers, throw out feeler words to see if there's anything that you connect over. Um, you know, family, religion, Try to give them a piece of you and who you are. Um, and, and once you've given them that piece of yourself, they're often willing to spend their time with you. They, they, they pick up on a connection. And, and even better, if you know something about them before you're reaching out to, to a degree that you know which things to pull on, right? It's like walking into their office and seeing that they've got pictures of their family on the wall. You know you can start talking about their family. If they've got pictures of the Green Bay Packers on the wall, it's not bad to be talking about the Green Bay Packers, right? Um, so you want to sell your, yourself as a person instead of selling your company. People buy from people, not companies. So start your call with a hook and then add a, val a value-add proposition. Uh, he called that a VAP, value-add proposition. Um, cold call to give something, give an idea give a best practice, give them something during that first call rather than trying to sell them right off at the start. Find what's in your, what's in their self-interest. What is your prospect's self-preservation? What do they, what do they care about? What's important to them? Ask, what are some of the challenges you've encountered now that you, uh, what, what are some things that you're encountering right now that are making your job hard? If you, if you get the answer to that question, now you've got, now you've got a really good direction to go, right? A, a thing to, to talk about. Intangibles are skill sets that you're born with that give you a competitive advantage over your competitors. There's something special about everybody. So think of five about yourself and, and highlight them in your script, you know, some, some examples that we saw here today were passion, humor, wit, but, um, it, you know, the five, the, the five things that are special about every different person are, are, are always different. So know what yours are and, and how you can get them into the conversation to, to connect. When you're ending a sales call, don't over talk, don't end in a question. Um, don't use super formal buzzwords like meeting, appointment, et cetera. Instead, try to keep it simple, use declarative sentences and use informal words for the, for the next steps. Like I'll drop by, we can jump on a call, things like that. May, keep it simple. 
Well, th- this has been absolutely fantastic, Paul. Um, where can our listeners read more about your work? How can they reach out to you if, if they want to uh, if they want to learn more about what you're up to? Sure. So my central hub is my website, uh, my first name, middle initial, and last name. So that's Paul M as in Michael Newberger, N-E-U-B-E-R-G-E-R.com. So again, that's Paul M Newberger. Dot com. It's the central hub for all my speaking engagements, all my training services. It's got links to all my socials, including my, my YouTube channel. There's content going on that every single week. Uh, the other thing that I would say, too, is if somebody really wants to take a deep dive into cold calling, probably the most effective, efficient way to do that is to go online and purchase my book. It's not just in paperback. It's also in Kindle as well as audiobook. The Secrets to Cold Call Success. It's been an Amazon bestseller in seven different categories. And a lot of the stuff we talked about here today, plus much, 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 much more all in that book. So again, paulmnewberger.com and perhaps check out my book for more secrets to cold call success. Well, I really appreciate what you taught, what you taught us here today, Paul. This is fantastic. It's been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. Um, if people work in field sales, you'll love Badger Maps, the number one route planner that helps you sell 20% more and drive 20% less. And we have a free trial at badgermapping.com. If, uh, if, if people could read or leave a rating for the podcast, um, if you find these helpful, it really helps us spread the word around that, it, uh, that it's out there. So take care until next time, everybody.